So it is a great honor to be at this conference and to have this sort of slowed down uh, teaching moment. And maybe we could close that door. Yeah. Children are excited out there. Uh, and I see we have note takers. So I better really know my stuff. But I'm so proud that you're here. And so Brother Harvey has asked me to unpack a portion of a book that we wrote uh, two years ago. It's entitled The Unflawed Leader. And it's available, uh, PPH, Australia. I'm not sure if it's still on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. It was for two years, but my contract ran out with the publisher, and I have awarded the book to Pentecostal Publishing House. So they will be the exclusive distributor of it now. When I first wrote it, I felt like the audience was bigger, perhaps, than UPCI because of the subject, and the book did pretty well. Uh, beyond the pale of our organization, but it really became a difficulty to have distributors contact me, then I would have to order the books, pay for the books, sell them to the distributor. It was just, I didn't like being the middleman, it's just a hassle. So we approached Publishing House and they said we would like to have it, so they have the copy right now and they're uh, working on it and it should be forthcoming. It's entitled The Unflawed Leader, and it's really a study in the leadership model of Jesus. And when I was writing it, my wife said, what, what's going to be the name of the book? I said, The Unflawed Leader. She said, oh, it's an autobiography? <laughs> no, she did not say that. Those words would never come out of her mouth because she knows me better than anybody. But it, the book is an attempt, could I say it this way, to push back, if not bring a correction, to some unfortunate leadership models that exist in the church. Everybody still love me? Let's keep working at it till we get better. And I certainly have a long way to go to be like the Lord. And I'm not what I want to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. And so Jesus is worthy of your highest thought your highest pursuit, your greatest achievement will be accomplished as you reach for Jesus. Because Elder Johnny James said, if it's not about Jesus, it's not about nothing. So in this book, The Unflawed Leader, we have 14 treatments of Jesus in real-time leadership moments. There's a lot of books that have been written about leadership, but have you ever thought about studying Jesus through the lens of leadership? We typically do not think of Jesus in sort of a CEO, you know, he's the boss, how's he going to handle problem people, how's he going to handle difficult situations? What sort of decisions is he going to make in the heat of a moment? Are we ever going to see Jesus at his worst? Is he going to have a meltdown? Is he going to, you know, just explode on somebody, blow him up and walk off? And so I think since he is 
the only perfect man that has ever lived. And he is the greatest leader the world has ever seen. The world has seen Winston Churchill and Julius Caesar and Abraham Lincoln and incredible leaders. But Jesus is the greatest leader. Hands down. The world has ever seen. Because he's the only perfect leader. Pilate even said, I find no fault in him. The writers in the gospel said, he has done all things well. Jesus even invited his students to look closely at him when he said, learn of me. I'm, I'm leery of leaders that don't want anybody to get close. I'm, I'm skeptical of leaders who don't want to let anybody into their personal life. It's not healthy. It's not good. Jesus said in Matthew 11, study me. Learn of me. Leaders who know who they are and where they've come from and where they're going can make very secure statements like that. Learn of me. Yeah. When you study Jesus, John 13, the setting of the Last Supper, nobody would wash feet, so Jesus washed feet. He's the greatest leader the world has ever seen. He didn't jockey for position. He didn't say, huh, wash your feet. You ought to be washing my feet. I'm the boss. I've been leading you jokers around here for the last three years. Didn't you learn anything? Get down there and wash my feet. He girded a towel. He's listening to them discussing who's going to be the greatest. He gets a towel and a water basin, a basin of water, washes their feet. Secure leaders can serve. Jesus, the Bible said in John 13, when you read it, the first five verses, said he came from God, he was going to God. He knew where he came from, he knew where he was going. He had nothing to lose, he had nothing to prove, he had nothing to hide. And I've been around leaders, they've always got something to prove. They've always got something to lose. You never see the full deck of cards, so to speak. They're always hiding something. Can we just get over that? And can we be transparent? Because if it's not real, it doesn't help anybody. Fake is over. And don't be so impressed with yourself that you have to protect your territory and protect your turf and fight for your position. I'm tired of all of that. We don't need it in the church. I know that's pretty hard, but it's true. We need to follow the Christ-like model of leadership. And we will always get a good result when we follow him. So the church business is the people business. We are all in the people business. Let's all say the people business. <laughs> In Arkansas, where my wife's from, and I had to put shoes on her feet when I married her, they say, the, they say business. We're not in the people business. We're in the people business. And the church business is the people business. And we need to never forget that. We're not in the program business. We're not in the building a bigger church than your church business. We're not in the competition business. We're in the people business. Let's get good at loving people. Let's get good at accepting and embracing people. Even people that don't look like us. 
And I don't need to say that in Australia, but I do need to say it in some places in America. When Jesus was asked, who's my neighbor? How did he respond to that? He told the story of the Good Samaritan. He introduced the most racially charged issue of the day. And the bad guy, the Samaritan, helps the good guy, the Jew. And at the end of the lecture, basically what Jesus is saying is, your neighbor is somebody who doesn't look like you. So get over yourself. In fact, my last, before the one I have right now, three or four disciples didn't look anything like me. Well, they weren't near as good looking as me, first of all. <laughs> they didn't have my hair color, my skin color, didn't have my culture. That's how we reach the world, people. <laughs> and so when we study Jesus, he will always bring us to a great place. Because we're in the people business. And Jesus was in the people business. So we're going to sort of take a look at this. We do not typically think of Jesus as a leader, like, you know, like a CEO. We think of him as Messiah, Savior, Healer, Deliverer, Teacher, Rabbi. But when you look at Jesus through the lens of leadership, in real-time leadership moments, as we've attempted to do in this book, The Unflawed Leader, you will develop a fresh appreciation for how great a leader Jesus was. In fact, John Ortman, who's a prolific Christian writer, said, if you were a betting man in the first century, would you put your money on the powerful Roman Empire or a nondescript rabbi from Nazareth to still have an enterprise 2,000 years later? <laughs> he said, we're still naming our children Matthew, Mark, Sarah, and Rebecca, and our dogs Nero and Caesar. <laughs> Listen. Don't underestimate Jesus' powerful leadership. Everything rises and falls with leadership. Not almost everything, everything. And leadership is nothing more and nothing less than influence. And don't sit here and listen to me for the next 30 minutes and say, well, I don't have a title, therefore I'm not a leader. Ha! Get that thought out of your mind right now. Just because you don't have a title or an office or a name on your door doesn't mean that you're not leading someone. You should be if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. You should be following him and leading someone else. That would be a good title of a book, Follow to Lead. Thank you. That was my first book. Follow to Lead. The end game of following is to lead. And so, if you're not sure who to lead first, lead yourself. Because if you can't lead yourself, nobody's going to follow you. And if they do, they're in trouble. So lead yourself well. Live a disciplined, sacrificial, proper life. And then you qualify to lead in the church. If you can lead yourself well, if you can lead your family well, Peter said then you're qualified to lead in the church. You wonder why you're not being promoted in your local church? It could be you're not leading yourself very well. Start doing a better job of that. And start adding value. This is what I love about Jesus. Everything he said, everything he did, he added value to someone else. He didn't take away things from people. He added things to people. And so we're looking at Jesus through the lens of leadership, this is a little different. 
than what we're used to. So what kind of a leader was Jesus? Let me say it this way. Someone asked me one time, they said, have you ever been to Pastor So-and-So's church? I said, no. They said, well, then you probably wouldn't know what the church is like, would you? I said, oh, I know exactly what the church is like. He said, but you've never been there. I said, I don't need to be there. I know the pastor. See, that's why they pay me the big money. I'm having fun. I don't know if you are, but I'm having a blast. Yeah. Someone said, if you want to know the temperature of the congregation, stick a thermometer in the mouth of the pastor. It's a terrifying thought, pastor, to realize, as I served as a 40-year pastor, that we are the greatest influencer in the congregation. It ought to keep you at wake, awake a few nights. Because your spirit, your attitude, your vision. J.T. Pugh said, whatever is in the heart of the pastor will come out in the congregation. No matter what it is. Because we do not minister in a vacuum. When you come to church, it's not like going to Walmart or Target or Aldi's. When you come to church, we are in a spiritual context. We are, we are born of God. We are born of one spirit, one faith, one baptism. And it's a spiritual community. We're connected. You're my brother. You're my sister. And so the pastor is the primary influencer, or should be. There's a problem if he's not. Talk to me after the service today. <laughs> but the pastor is the primary influencer of the church. And I had a panic attack, oh, many years ago. And a reality hit my mind, hit my spirit, and I was praying. And I was seeking God. I said, God, is our church healthy? Am, am, am I out of balance in any area? You know, I like cheeseburgers, but I don't want to eat them three times a day, seven days a week. Am I just focusing on one thing? Am I just, is our church balanced? Are they getting a good diet? Are, are, it just worried me. And it should. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, what sort of fruit are you producing? That's how you know if you're healthy or not. First of all, do you have fruit? And secondly, what kind of fruit is it? And so pastors are the primary influencers of the church. And pastor, I applaud you. I'm proud of you. I celebrate you. I wish we had 10 more just like you. We need your vision. We need your passion. We need your attitude. We need your purpose. Because we need to develop a lot of people that are just like you. That have caught your spirit. That have caught your attitude. Look, if a man is following Jesus, I will follow him to the gates of hell. If a pastor is obeying the Lord and in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ and has accountability pieces in his life, I will go with them all the way to the end of the world. That's all I need. That's all I need. If the man is honest, if he has integrity, I'm not asking him to be perfect. Perfection is for losers because it's a straw man. It's not out there. There's only one that ever was. And he didn't become perfect. He was born perfect. And he's our model. So here's how it works, pastors. 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's how it works. If you're reaching for Jesus, don't worry, it's going to be okay. If you're trying to emulate him and imitate him, 
It's going to be okay. And we need your model, Pastor. We need your example. We don't need you to be a King Tut in your pulpit. We don't need you to be high and mighty and untouchable and unapproachable and unreachable. We don't need you to go from your house to your car to your office to the pulpit to the office to the car back to your house. When you're done preaching your great conference sermon on Sunday, we need you to come off the platform and walk among us and walk slowly through the crowd and let us touch you and you touch us because we need that model. We need that you know, did Jesus just hang out with the Sunday crowd? Was Jesus just interested in building a big mega church? How did that work out for him on Fish and Chips Sunday? <laughs> you know, when he fed the 5,000 with loaves and fishes. 5,000 men plus women and children. That was the greatest miracle some human eyes had ever seen. With five loaves and two fishes, he feeds thousands. And I can see Peter, James, and John, the executive committee. Man, this is the greatest Sunday crowd we've ever had. We've given away free food. We had dinner on the grounds. We organized in groups of 50. We've administrated this. We've got this together. If Jesus really does a good job in his sermon before everybody leaves, we'll have 40,000 next Sunday. <laughs> James, did you look at his sermon notes? No, he didn't show them to me. <laughs> well, I hope he doesn't mess up. He did. Jesus ruined everything. He got up and he preached commitment. He preached sacrifice. He didn't get up and say, well, you can climb that mountain, just one foot in front of the other. When you get to the top of that mountain, there'll be a great view. Shall we pray? <laughs> oh, no. He didn't preach a feel-good sermon. He said, except you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life in you and no part of me. And have a nice day. And the Bible said, some said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear this? And Jacob looked at his wife, Sarah, and said, get the kids. Where do you want to go to church next Sunday? We can find a better deal, better food, more free stuff. This pastor's asking for too much of a commitment He's asking us to cannibalize ourselves or something. I don't know what he's talking about. Jesus was inviting them into discipleship. Into really becoming something and making something out of their life. And not just be consumers. And I'm going to tell you there is a, a landscape in the world today, in Christianity in particular where people are looking for the best deal, the best offer on Sunday morning, the best praise team, the best smoke and lights and mirrors and drama and theater and theatrics. And that is not the call of Christianity. Jesus said, unless you take up your cross and follow me, you have no part of me. So it didn't work out too good for Jesus to try to please everybody. He didn't sneak up on anybody. He didn't pull any punches. He said, if you're going to follow me, you've got to have a cross. If you're going to follow me, you've got to subordinate every other relationship. And he knew that he could never reach the world with a church full of consumers. And he let them all walk away. Are you okay if people walk away? Can you take it? I pastored 40 years. I had people leave our church. It always crushed me. Even if I was happy to see them go. <laughs> Did I say that? That was not Stan Gleason. That was real, wasn't it? But it still hurts. It's a form of rejection. You mean I wasn't good enough? 
Can we work it out? Gary Thomas wrote a book entitled When to Walk Away. He's a Christian author. He synthesized the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And he identified 24 times when Jesus either walked away from toxic people or he let people walk away from him. And he didn't go chasing them down. When the rich young ruler walked away sorrowful, Jesus didn't say, Oh, wait a minute. Isn't there a little check you want to write out before you go? Why is he going to say that? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Who needs your money? Who needs your discipleship? Don't become codependent and be so needy. Be who you are. Be who he's called you to be. If they want to follow, let them follow. But not to your destruction, not to your distraction. And so Jesus was the greatest, most perfect leader the world has ever seen. Think of it. He brought no wounds, hurts, habits, hang-ups. He brought no unmet emotional issues to his leadership model. He brought no guilt motivation to his congregation. Well, you better win souls or you're going to hell. No, that doesn't work. It doesn't last. We have to be inspired by love. He brought no dysfunction to his leadership team. So in the book, I tried to let Jesus come out of the ink and paper of your Bible and to see him in a little different leadership light of health, wellness, and balance that we should be reaching for in the church. So in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, Peter said, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow. Everybody say follow. Follow, follow his steps. Follow his steps. If Jesus did it, you can do it. If he didn't do it, don't do it. That's powerful. That's deep. Back in the 90s, I don't know if it hit Australia, but in America there was this big commercialized Christian promotion called WWJD. What would Jesus do? I thought, Pfft. that's not the real question. The real question is, what would Jesus not do? That's what we really need to be talking about. So Paul said, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Peter said, follow his steps. Are you getting the idea? These are the apostles. They're not making it about them. They're making it about him. Follow Jesus. So I mentioned last night the missionary Ken Cantrell. When he showed up at our church on a Sunday morning, he was 27. He was shaggy. Uh, he was, had never obeyed the gospel, been around the church his whole life. So I showed up at his work the next day. I found out where he worked. He told me on Sunday. So I showed up. He worked at a, he managed a Champ Sporting Goods. So I thought, well, I'm going to show up there and I'll use the excuse I need some golf balls. You know, I, I, uh, I play golf, and why not? It's holy ground. <laughs> and I already had 12 dozen golf balls in the garage, but when you play as bad as I do, another dozen it always comes in handy. People give me golf balls with my name on it. I'm like, why do the squirrels out in the woods need to know who shot that ball out here? <laughs> and so 
I'm walking around, champs. It's about as big as this room. It takes me a half hour to find the golf balls, and I'm staring at every security camera as I walk by. I'm hoping he's in the office and he'll see me. Sure enough, he comes out. Pastor, I was just at your church yesterday. What a coincidence. I said, oh, I, I just wanted to see if you had any plans for lunch. Well, no. I said, could I buy your lunch today? Well, sure. So we go out to lunch. I said, tell me about yourself. He said, I was born and raised in an apostolic church, and I never got baptized. I was never filled with the Holy Ghost. He's 27. I said, tell me about that. He said, I'll tell you one story. It's a church of about 40 people in another state. He said the pastor had the microphone cranked up like it was a general conference to 40 people. <laughs> screaming. Jumped off the platform. My son and I, my three-year-old son and I were sitting in the second row. My son's name was Justin. He looked at him and said, Justin, you don't want your daddy to die and go to hell, do you? He said, that's why I never got saved. He said, you see this hamburger you bought me for lunch? I said, yeah. He said, I like hamburgers, but I don't want you shoving it down my throat. I thought, oh, you're going to like me. <laughs> I asked him if I could teach him and his wife a Bible study. He said, sure. After the fifth lesson, he asked me if he could be baptized. Amen. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Let me just show you the model. Would Jesus jump off? Screaming in a microphone with 40 people, intimidating a three-year-old, try to appeal to the emotions of a father. That's ridiculous. The leader is broken. It's not real. Does that make sense? I'm not being critical. Well, I sort of am. I'm just trying to be real. I said, oh, you're going to love me, man. Five lessons, he gets baptized. The next Sunday night, seriously, in 45 years of preaching, this is the only time it's ever happened. He was sitting over there on a Sunday night service. I was right in the middle of my sermon, and I had three more really good points. <laughs> and he wrecked everything. He jumped up. He ran to the front of the, right in front of the pulpit, and he put his hands up like this. Bro, I'm not done preaching. <laughs> Go sit down. No. no, I didn't do that. I know what's going on. What's the point of preaching? Yeah. It's not to get your sermon done. It's to bring somebody to a point of decision. <laughs> Raising the church, never ran to the altar. Why is he running now? Maybe he's finding the real Jesus. Not a made-up Jesus, not a manipulative Jesus, not a forceful Jesus, but a leader. He ran to the altar. He lifted his hands. You know, the Bible uses the language the Holy Ghost fell. It fell on him. You can see it. It blew the whole church up, and he was filled with the Holy Ghost. And so I thought, wow, this is amazing. Finished the Bible study. It took me about a year. Whole year, I was in his house every week, spending two or three hours at a time, making a disciple, spending time. Not realizing that one day he's going to take this model to Africa. So I brought him into my leadership training. That's like Jesus. Jesus spent intentional time with the brightest and the best. Every pastor should have a class. I'm going to say it. I got the hair color to say this kind of stuff now. <laughs> Every pastor, we cannot change our churches from back here. You think your next great sermon is going to change everybody's life? It will not. We have to come out here. And we have to do this. Let's go to lunch. And I'm buying. Because I can't stand cheap preachers. <laughs> I 
Uh, I'm, if you can't tell, I'm really relaxed and I'm having a good time. And so Cantrell, he comes in my leadership training. And he, I give him a book to read. He's like, brings it back next Sunday. What else you got? You know, Paul said, commit to faithful men. If your pastor gives you something to read and you remember it a year later, you're not faithful. We're done with you. We don't need you. We need you to get back to us within 48 hours if you're going to be faithful, if you don't have any more respect for the leader than that. Everybody okay? Just take a deep breath so I know you're not passing out right now. <laughs> and so he comes on our staff a couple years later. He becomes one of our pastoral preachers and speakers. And then I made the fatal mistake of taking him with me on a mission to Africa. I should have never done that. <laughs> you always lose your best leaders. And we got into Africa, and then Africa got into them. <laughs> I'm not patting myself on the back. Just, just reach for Jesus. Amen. So about seven, eight years ago, I'm preaching a camp meeting in Illinois. Preach three nights. Stranger comes up to me. He says, I've listened to you preach for three nights now. Do you know a missionary named Ken Cantrell? I'm like, duh. <laughs> I thought, I want to see, I want to see what he says. So I'm like, can't trail, can't trail. Yeah, I think I heard of him. You know, I trained him for 18 years. You know? <laughs> yeah, I think I heard of him. Why do you ask? He goes, well, I've listened to you preach for three nights. You know, you preach a whole lot like he does. <laughs> I'm like, Dude, he didn't get awesome all by himself, you know. <laughs> he had a pretty good teacher. My point is, there's a lot worse people in the world to be like than me. Amen. And there's a lot worse people in the world to be like than you. So what's holding up your delay? And be like Jesus. Because if it's not Jesus, it doesn't help anybody. So study Jesus. Jesus invited us to do that. Insecure people will never allow you to do that. But Jesus was the greatest, most secure leader you will ever study. Nothing to lose, nothing to hide. He knows where he's coming from. He knows where he's going. He's not protecting the turf. In fact, he's saying, guys, come here. Listen up. Everything I'm doing, you're going to do it. And you're going to do it better and greater than I ever did it. Because that's the goal. Of, see, Jesus was a rabbi. Do you know what real teachers do? I don't, I don't just mean that, you know, people that get up and talk. I'm talking about called teachers. If you studied the seven spiritual gifts of Romans 12, not sure if I can name a prophet, Administrator, giver, teacher, uh, drawing a blank. Anyway, Romans 12, seven spiritual gifts. If you synthesized all the gifts, what did Jesus most consistently operate in? Teacher, rabbi. That's what changes the world. Teachers change the world. The highest calling is teacher. It really is because they're the ones that do the heavy lifting of disciple making. They don't just preach great sermons. They get down where people are living and they say, let's take a look at this. The disciples in the first century following a rabbi were said that they were collecting the dust of their rabbi's feet. As he traipsed up and down the hillside of Judea. And Jesus invited them to do that. And so we should follow his steps and imitate him because others are following us. John Maxwell said, the leader knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. 
And so in the book, we're simply taking a look at the leadership model of Jesus. And I thought for sure I was going to give the exact lecture I did an hour ago, but it's been so different, and it's, it's all right. But let me quote H.G. Wells, who probably was agnostic, but he said, I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the center of all human history. And Jesus is the greatest leader the church has ever seen. As leaders in the church, we have no other option but to pattern our model after Jesus. It's, you're locked in. You don't have any choice. Jesus said, follow me. That means imitate me. Peter said in the text that we read, 1 Peter 1.21, follow his steps. If he did it, you should do it. If he didn't treat people a certain way, don't you do it. I know people, they are hand grenades looking for people to blow up. They're like terrorists in the church. Everybody just looks straight ahead. <laughs> and they get a load off their mind and just go blow somebody up, and then they feel better. Oh, I'm, I told them, by God, I told them the truth. Well, that doesn't help anybody. I told them Acts 2.38. Now, if they go to hell, that's up to them. Oh, wow. You really changed somebody's life. That doesn't help anybody. In fact, when I teach Bible studies in people's homes and they've never been to our church, I don't even invite them to church. Because I am the church. Amen. They're going to ask me. They want, to, they want to know what church I go to or what church I pastor. They always do because I'm bringing the church. I'm the culture. <laughs> I'm bringing it. I'll never forget. We had a first-time guest. He's an Eastern Indian. Had a red dot in his forehead. He's a Hindu. His name was Anuj came to church. I met him. I took him to lunch. He said, now I've been to India eight times. The Downs are very invested as well. And I love the Indian people. They have a very, very special place. And we went to lunch. He said, Pastor, I want you to come to my house. I said, well, I would like to come to your house. He said, he said, I want you to pray a blessing. You're a guru. <laughs> I thought, well, I'm a Jesus guru. <laughs> yeah, I want you to pray a blessing. I said, okay, I'll come to your house. So we, he takes me through his house. He said, we're pulling the driveway. He said, you see that house right there? Billy Butler, member of Kansas City Royal. He lived right there. So it's a pretty nice neighborhood. So we go through the house. I'm ready to go. I spent about three hours with him. I got my hand on the front door. I'm ready to walk out. I turn around. And Nuge, I'm not exaggerating. I've been known to exaggerate, but I am not exaggerating. He was like this. <laughs> I said, Nuge, what's wrong? He said, Pastor, you prayed God will bless my business. That will pay off your whole church. Wow. All of a sudden, I went. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what happened. I thought, I got saved, sanctified, petrified 30 year church members and haven't given a lousy dollar to pay off the building. Here's a Hindu with a red dot in his forehead. How does that happen? Because I'm bringing Jesus to him. <laughs> the 
because I'm modeling Jesus, because I'm the church. So follow Jesus. And by the way, Anuj got married. They've got a little girl. His wife is Talisa. The little girl is Anjali. They're saved. He's baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost. No more red dot in his forehead. He's the number one giver of the church. I praise the Lord. I give God all the glory. So if what you're doing is not working for you, get the book, Unflawed Leader. <laughs> it's just about Jesus. Last thing I'm going to say, and then I'll open it up for a question, is when you read the Bible, if you're starting to read the Bible through this year, you should. Pick a lens. Like, for years, I read the Bible th through looking through the lens of disciple-making. For example, Elijah is discipling Elisha. You see that, that's, in fact, that's the first disciple-making model in the Bible, really. And if you want to study leadership, read the Bible through the lens of leadership. Watch for leaders. Watch for how we should treat people and how we should raise up the body of Christ. Anyway, any questions? Oh, I didn't do that good of a job. Anybody have a question about Jesus as a leader? Why don't we stand? Thank you for letting me be a part of your life for the last 45 minutes. Why don't we just lift our hands and reach for Jesus right now? Come on, open your mouth and reach for the Lord.